Welcome to the show. In this episode, I have a conversation with photographer Brian Adams. Brian originally got into photography by way of videography. When he was a kid, growing up skateboarding with his friends, he would film everything. The motivation back then was getting a shot in one of the local skateboard and snowboard videos. In high school, he took a photography class because it was the closest thing to a videography class at the time. That experience, along with what he was reading about skateboard photography, helped him make the transition from video to photo. Today, Brian is a well-known photographer with photo credits in legacy publications. Okay, time to give the Crude Company men a shout out. These are the people who have subscribed to the Crude Patreon for $50 or more. Trina Duber, Seward Brewing Company, The Grind Coffee Shop in Juneau, Derek Adolph, Blue and Gold Board Shop, Sharon Liska, and Alaska Surf Adventure. Thank you to all the Patreon subscribers. This podcast wouldn't be possible without you. If you subscribe to the Crude Magazine Patreon, thank you. Your money helps keep these conversations going. So if you enjoy these conversations, you can subscribe at www.patreon.com slash crude magazine. That's patreon.com slash crude magazine. And pick the subscription tier that works for you. Okay, back to Brian Adams. In 2018, Brian released I Am Inuit, a project that focused on the Alaskan Inuit people. Through photographs and short stories, Brian was able to successfully convey the Inuit life and perspective. When everything was said and done for I Am Inuit, all the work amounted to a critically celebrated book and museum exhibit. Recently, Brian's been working on a new project called Alaka, which is the Inuit word for my relatives. Alaka will focus on the Inuit of the Circumpolar, which includes Alaska, Russia, Canada, and Greenland. So here he is, Brian Adams. <laughs> this red light right here, it means we're recording. Okay, fired up. Crude conversations. Listen more than you talk. Go to work. How do I sound? Is this okay? Yeah, you sound great. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> So did you go skateboarding the other night? Uh, I try and skate like every night I possibly can. <laughs> um, usually just ninth and K right now. You know, like that's the only go to good spot to go where, you know, it's not going to be a bust anymore. <laughs> and ninth and K is a garage. It's a garage. Yeah. Right on the corner of ninth and K. And yeah, we got a good relationship with the building. They like don't mind us skating there. Um, the only time we have to leave is when Guardian shows up and they're just doing their job. So they just tell us to go and we go and then we get to, we leave for a little while and then come back and skate some more. <laughs> so it's all super cordial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The building, it's funny because like people will come out of the building and they'll be like, Hey, do you need us to move our car? <laughs> so you have more room over here? And we're like, nah, it's cool. We just don't want to be in your way. <laughs> Dude, that's like unheard of. I mean, considering how we grew up. Right. And getting kicked out of spots constantly. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like even a couple of years ago, like last winter, they put up a sign and I was like, oh, no, like this is not good. It's finally happening. It's finally happening. There was like signs posted up in there and it was like skateboarders. And I was like, oh, no. And then it said skateboarders. Please pick up your trash. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's mellow. Yeah. Super mellow. Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. And we talked to like people at the building. They were like, yeah, it's it's cool as long as, you know, you pick up your trash. And we actually like you guys down here because you keep the vagrants out at night. And we're like, perfect. Cool. That's awesome. Because like I was saying about back in the day, we were kind of considered the vagrants. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's skateboarding's grown so much now where it's like, you know, people that we're probably talking to like they have like a cousin or a nephew or a kid that skates and they're just like oh yeah it's cool they're, they're good kids yeah yeah i mean tony hawk and his 900 has just <laughs> infiltrated mainstream <Right. laughs> absolutely oh my gosh so you also skate with a lot of like younger kids yeah all over the board like it's just whoever shows up they're part of the crew <laughs> that's what's up that's awesome yeah. and have you noticed like their perspective on 
skateboarding in Alaska in these kind of like public areas Mm -hmm. is a lot different again, you know, than when we were growing up. Yeah, absolutely. So so they have a a better relationship with authority. Oh yeah, totally. Way, way more polite. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. I I mean, that's, that's a pretty interesting (laughs) concept too, that younger generations of skateboarders have a better relationship with authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember skateboarding at Hanshu. Um, I mean, so many different situations occurred, but I remember specifically one where, uh, my friend or our friend Gus Engel, his brother Woody told a security guard to like, fuck off. And you know, it was, it was pretty mutual. The security guard wasn't being too cool. Yeah. Um, but then Woody (laughs) ran into the woods right behind Hanchu middle school and like the cops got called and it was like, we're like, Woody, just come out of the woods. And he's like, no, like, you know, you can hear him like right in the woods right there, you know? (laughs) So there was, there was so many different situations where, you know, we were yelling at like adult authority figures. Absolutely. So that's, that's yeah. cool that it doesn't really happen like that anymore. Yeah, I think so. For the most part, uh, once in a while, there's some like typically security guards, never police anymore. Police like don't care. Like they're just like they're just skateboarding, but like security guards, they, they can get a little aggressive sometimes, but it's funny though, because nowadays it's back in the day we used to run. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pick up your board and bolt. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And now it's like, yeah, Hey, we're just, we're just skateboarding. Let's talk about it. Um, we got a good relationship here. Like, you know, we're not hurting anybody. We're not hurting anything. So, yeah. <laughs> but it took all of those past incidences to be where we are now. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you today. So we're in it here in Alaska right now. We're currently dropping into the darkest months of the year. Yeah. Do you ever have trouble keeping yourself motivated around this time of year? Absolutely. This year, especially for some reason, I growing up here in Alaska, it never really bothered me. It was just something I was used to. Mm -hmm. And then this last year, though, I've really felt like I needed more light, (laughs) you know, because it's just the sun rises so late and then it drops so early. And this is one of the first years I've been like, oh my gosh, I need some light. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like trying to get out as much as I can right now at like peak hours, like of the sunlight, just to like get that little bit of vitamin D I can and (laughs) soak in some sun and like try and make pictures. So do you feel like you kind of have a seasonal depression at all? Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, uh, Seasonal depression this year a little bit, yeah. Uh, depression in general, I've been fighting for like years and finally have like sat down and started to deal with it, which has been really good for me in the last couple of years. And this is depression? Just general depression, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. But so I've, I feel like the last couple of years there were some hard times and uh, just getting through that and then, yeah, the, the light doesn't help at all. Absolutely not. So just kind of like, dealing with it and getting through it and it's going good it's going a lot better now than it was say like six months ago (laughs) so what made you decide to deal with it uh just like family and friends just being like you need to do something you need to sit like sit down with somebody talk with somebody so like i see somebody now i talk to somebody um i'm taking one med and i could swear by it or i'm just like i could be a <laughs> i could seriously be a spokesperson for this med if they wanted me to be and be like that's this great is the best thing in the world <laughs> yeah yeah it totally helps it makes me feel like um like all cylinders are firing in my brain like it just it really helps yeah in the same way that we were talking about how skateboarding has changed, I think that the perception of mental health, I mean, that, there's no question Absolutely. That, that that has changed. Absolutely. You could talk about it now and like, you don't have to be like um, ashamed of it. It's just like an open conversation. You just are like, yeah, I, I, I am obviously depressed. Thanks for pointing that out. Let's Let's deal with this. So I was in a car accident when I was 13. Right. Super bad. I remember that. Um, I was in a coma, medically induced coma for over a week. Mm-hmm. And so there were, you know, kind of large portions of my brain that were damaged. Damn. And what's great about the brain 
right, is the neural pathways find different ways, right? They go around those mm-hmm. damaged areas. And so I don't suffer from depression, but I have had to find ways around, you know, mm-hmm. that traumatic brain injury. Mm-hmm. So as you see right here, I'm holding notes in my hand. I've had notes ever since I was like, I mean, probably about that same year. So 13 or 14, I started taking like aggressive notes, Mm -hmm. you know, and they used to just be on like little pieces of paper and just the act of writing it down helps me remember. Yeah. And so, you know, being more honest with ourselves about kind of our, uh, our shortcomings, I think probably comes a lot easier the older we get. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You said that you eventually decided to kind of deal with it. Mm -hmm. Was there maybe a moment where you're like, all right, like I need to start working on this? Yeah. um, I mean, there was lots of moments that finally just led up to like wanting to deal with the way I felt about life. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I think it was after I actually like openly talked to like a friend and she was like, hey, you should talk to somebody. And... But there were just like times where it was like, I wouldn't say I was like, I wasn't like suicidal where I'd be like, I'm going to put a gun to my head. You know, it was more like suicidal where I'd be like, uh, I'm okay because I fly so much in little planes and all the time, all the time, you know, I'd be like, I'm okay if this plane crashes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was, and once I told my doctor that she was like, all right, yeah, maybe we should, uh, <laughs> maybe we should talk to somebody and maybe you should try this. And I'm like, oh, great, let's do this. <laughs> and it's just been, it's been great ever since. Uh, yeah, you know, it's all, it's been going up. It's yeah. Been, it's, been, it's been, it's all been going up since then. And I'm really happy about that. Well, that's great, man. Yeah. I'm really happy to hear that. Thanks. <laughs> so where I was kind of going with that about the, um, seasonal depression was that with myself, I've realized that in the winter time when we are like in the heart of like January and February, right? Yeah. I just need to get up and start working, mm-hmm. you know, keep my mind like active elsewhere yeah and get myself into a routine with accomplishments and goals are you more of a routine guy or kind of order and chaos guy more probably i like i like to think of myself as like a routine guy but it's totally ordering (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh, i wake up i check my emails and kind of just let the day go from there um the most order i have in my life right now is just like with the kids because like i got to get them to school on time i got to make sure that they got their meals all on time and that's that's about as ordered as I am because the rest of it's just as a freelancer. I've been freelancing for like 15 years now. Um, it's just always been you have to just roll with it. You know, mm-hmm. you just got to go take it day by day and see what the next day is going to bring you. It takes a certain type of person to be a freelancer. How long has it taken you to be comfortable with that career? Uh, I think I was comfortable with it right away. It just always felt right. Um, right out of high school, I started assisting a photographer, Clark James Mishler, and I loved working for him. I loved what I did with him. Um, but you know, uh, within two years of assisting him, I was like wanting to get, I was ready to do my own thing. And I started, I picked up my first client through my brother cause he's a graphic designer he hooked me up with Kaladi brothers and they were like my first client. So I was doing product photos for them and just, we were shooting all these press ads back in the day. And that was like my first client. And I was like, all right, so I'm going to give them my like three month notice. And then in 2005, I'm going to start freelancing. So just went straight for it. Just always felt right. And then the first few years are just completely, you know, terrible as far as like a career goes. <laughs> You're just like <laughs> trying to build clients, sure. get your portfolio out there, meet people, and uh but those first like yeah three years it's three to five years even it's just like you're just trying to build a name and it's just really check to check kind of living absolutely (laughs) yeah (laughs) and you feel like you're beyond that now yeah uh, i think i got a i think i have like a nice steady you know income as far as it goes like i can kind of predict um how each year is going to be based off of what i'm applying for or what work i have going on what clients i have lined up and yeah, it seems, seems good. Steady now. Can't complain. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, also you have all of those past years of experience, you know, to help guide you. Right. Right. Experience is huge. You know, it's just like, 
you're learning something every year you learn something new or you make a new body of work that you're excited about or it's like every year it just goes up you just have to you just can't stop <laughs> you have to keep going but you absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what are you currently excited about what <clears throat> projects oh man so 2019 was like really chill for me. I didn't spend a lot of time in the field. I did a few long-term photo essays for some people. Um, but it was mostly this year was um, applying for grants for 2020. Um, a lot of like museum and gallery work with various places throughout the United States. But my my main focus right now, like the next big body of work I want to come out is Alaka. It's the Inuit word for my relatives. Mm -hmm. So that's like my next main project I want to work on. And I got I got two fellowships for it last year in 2018. So I was able to start the project. And then I'm hoping for some more funding for 2020 to like really get it going, like really like dive into it. So it's a body of work that's um, focused on Inuit of the Circumpolar. So uh, in 2018, I had... Uh, I mean, you would come out, the book came out, the exhibit all went out. Um, so that project's wrapped. That was all focused on Alaskan Inuit. And so my next project, I wanted to be focused on circumpolar Inuit. So Inuit in Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So that's like my next main big body of work. And I was able to start it uh, in July of 2018, where I went on a trip with my friend Bruce and Kaktovic. Uh, we went from... Kaktovik, Alaska to Aklavik, Canada, where he actually grew up. So we went by boat and he does two trips per year, once by snow machine, once by boat. And I was originally going to go on that snow machine trip with him, but then I was just, it was just like not working out. And I was like, okay with it. Cause I'm not a strong <laughs> <laughs> snow machine driver. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to keep like i'm gonna hold you back like this is not a good idea <laughs> um and then i was just like the logistics of that whole trip was just too much so uh, i got i was able to get on that boat ride with him and uh him and his daughter and her boyfriend and a couple others and yeah we took a boat ride over to a clavic canada it was pretty cool what was that experience like it was really amazing uh it took a few days to actually get out of kaktovic because the ice the sea ice would come in and then it would go out and then it would come in and go out. So like there, we had to wait for a good open window to, uh, to like bolt past the sea ice and get to, to, to make it all the way to a clavic. Kind of frogger across it. Yeah, exactly. There was times where we were like right on the beach in the boat cause the ice had come in and we're just like swerving through all this ice a little bit at a time and then see an opening and bolt. <laughs> is that a symptom of climate change or has it always been like that? Uh, definitely climate change. Um, y y everything was like, everything's been different for them. They've watched it all change so much where it used to be so much more predictable and now it's completely unpredictable. You mm -hmm. don't know if there's going to be ice. You don't know if it, you don't, you, you never know. Yeah. Everything's different. So with your book, I am Inuit, and this new project that you're working on, what was the motivation to pursue it? For I am Inuit? Yeah, as well as this new circumpolar yeah. project. So I am Inuit came about where um, I had I am Alaskan come out, my mm -hmm. first book. And so the, the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska, they reached out to me and they were like, we saw this book, we love this book. And uh, the this lady, Kelly, at ICC, she reached out to me. Was like, I like, I love your book. I'm a big fan of Humans of New York, and she's she thought it would be a great idea to, um, you know, build a body of work on Alaskan Inuit that's similar to the work frame of um, Humans of New York. And so eventually, you know, I, I was like, well, we can keep it within like kind of this brand that I got going on right now. So how about I am Inuit? <laughs> and so we went with that, and. Uh, yeah, we started, I, I, I told him, like, I gave him like a budget of how much it would cost to do it. And it was like, you know, for all the travel, my fees, um, you know, just hotels, flights, everything. Like, I didn't, I, I gave him like a $100,000 budget for this project. And they were like, I, I was like, well, we'll see if that happens. <laughs> and I didn't hear anything for like three months. And I was like, well, I guess that project's not happening. <laughs> 
And then, yeah, three months later, she reached out. She was like, I got our first grant funding for the project. Let's do it. It's like, all right, here we go. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, uh, but as I was working on that project, um, you know, I'd, I'd meet people and they would talk about like, yeah, like Bruce, like his relatives in Canada and stuff and uh, learning more about Inuit, which, you know, I'm, I'm a Nupiak and, you know, I'm very aware and I know about my own people and, you know, mostly North, Northwestern Alaska that I've been learning about for the last, the last 15 years. But, um, learning about through that project, like Inuit and Russia and Canada and everything, I was like, oh, this is a whole nother project that we could do afterwards. And yeah, so just kind of trying to do it on my own. Um, the Anchorage Museum has partnered with me, so that's really cool. And they'll be a part of it, but uh, yeah, just doing it, doing it as I can. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. How often do you uh, do you start a project like that and then realize like, oh, it kind of opened the floodgates, like all of this other stuff, you know, all this, this mess of other stuff kind of spills out and you're like, oh man, that's a project. That's a project. That's a project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems like for me and uh, most photographers, like um, when say we get hired to do an assignment, um, you go out and you photograph the assignment, but you might see something within that assignment you're working on that could be a real strong personal project for you to work on. And the personal projects are so important because mm -hmm. I mean, they keep you motivated and they, they feed your soul. They feed your soul. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, mo all the work I typically get from anybody, like any photo editor or publication, it's based off of those personal projects. Um, they, those are the ones that everybody's like, okay, I want you to try and photograph for us, like how you photograph for this, uh, like this personal project. It kind of seems very similar to, say, a college professor, right? They have their academic work that they're mm -hmm. doing, but then it's always also preferred that they publish. Yeah. You know, so it's like, of course, they're doing the teaching thing, right? And in your situation, maybe that would be akin to, uh, you know, you're doing your contract work. But then in addition to your contract work, you're doing these passion projects that are really not only feeding your soul, but also showcasing like what you're all about. Right. Um, one of my first big like um, like it was a commercial job I did for ANTHC and uh, this freelance graphic designer, he hired me to go to, to photograph for him uh, for this project. And he sent me to Kivalina, where my family's originally from. And while I was there, I did all the work that was expected of me, like because because it was for the hospital, like I photographed the clinic, the people that worked at the clinic. And, you know, I, I made all the photos that they needed for whatever um, marketing material they were working on. Uh, but when I was there, you know, I, I saw like the Kivalina seawall and it was like, oh, my God, like this is not good. Like this is why they have to move. And so that just going on that commercial job and photographing so i was basically photographing for <laughs> ANTHC and their marketing material but also like starting my own first body of work mm -hmm. on climate change in alaska in 2007 as you're doing work like that do you ever feel like kind of this um this responsibility to report on that because nobody else will or nobody else is Absolutely. Especially at the time, like in 2007, people were still debating whether or not climate change is real. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, like after like, you know, years later, I was like, all right, we did a great job. Like journalists doing a good job. I feel like we're all on the same page. Everybody's agreeing like, yes, this is actually real. This is really happening. And then Trump got elected. And I was like, oh, God, I feel like we just took 10 steps backwards. And everybody's just saying <laughs> it's not real again. And like now we have so much more work to do. You know, one thing that I have uh, found interesting, um, I have never been up north to, to any of the villages, <clears> but <throat> I have edited footage of interviews um, with Alaska natives, you know, up north and them talking about climate change. And it is there's no question about it no. to them. You know, it's Absolutely. like they are on the front lines. It's like, yeah, that's where our beach used to be. Yeah. What kind of stories have you heard from up north where it's just like. Obviously, this is occurring. 
Um, I mean, or even things that you've seen for yourself, just things that I've seen for myself. The first time I went to New Tuck, well, I guess the only time I went to New Tuck was in 2008. And that was a really big eye opener for me. Um, when I went there at the time, you know, uh, I went to the coast and it was like with the writer and it was with our contacts and they were like, yeah, we're losing, you know, 90 feet a year. And th this is how we know we're losing 90 feet a year. Um, they had this giant piece of like m machinery and they were like, you could walk to that three years ago. And it was way out there, mm -hmm. you know, and that was like some of the first real eye opening experiences for me in documenting climate change. Yeah, New Tuck, they're on their way though. They're moving. They're they're moving right now. I'm the sure. village is, is yeah. physically moving. Yeah, exactly. They have their new spot. So they're headed. They're, they're making the move over there. What is that like? I mean, I'm not sure if you know, and you, maybe you can even just guess, but what is that like to have to physically move your village or <laughs> the place that you live because this impending right. doom absolutely um geez it's logistically extremely difficult <laughs> i bet <laughs> you know you have to build new houses or figure out how to move houses which isn't really a good, the case for uh new tuck um it's logistically extremely hard and they're not getting any like really quick help about it even though like they're the ocean the sea is right there on them now it's taking so long to actually make these moves happen, which is really strange to me, considering most of these places settled in these spots because that's where the school was built and that's where the church was built. And these were previously nomadic peoples that moved from fish camp or hunting camps and they always were moving and then they had they settled in these places, you know, and now they're not getting the help that they deserve or are entitled to. And how many people? are in this village uh i forget how many are in new tuck but like kivalina is about 350 ish you know so it's the each each of them are around there yeah maybe so 400 so 350 to 400 men women and children to move an entire village right and exactly. these are i mean these are buildings yeah these are homes um schools churches everything's gotta go yeah yeah, yeah. mm-hmm that's crazy to me. Yeah. Kivalina is on their way too. Um, they're finally, um, they're, they're, they need a new school. So that's, what's what triggering this, uh, new road for them. So there's a road that's being built from Kivalina and then four miles inland. And that, that's where the new school is going to be built. Um, I think once that school's done, eventually that'll like trigger the move for the village to move. Cause that's a ways to go. What kind of reactions do you get once you produce this work, once this work is out into the world? Generally, um, very supportive. Like, you know, I've had friends ask me about like people, if I get like a lot of like um, hate mail or comments based off of just like the amount of subsistence imagery I show, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, everything so far has been really very... Uh, very good. Very, very nice. Very supportive. <laughs> because, I mean, social media can be a cesspool. Right. And when you post, I mean, I, I love all your photos. I'm, I'm, I've am i been a fan for a long time. Thanks, babe. But, but when you post stuff that is of, you know, a whale being caught yeah. or, uh, you know, hanging meat or, I mean, it is it is a glimpse into such a long-standing, beautiful culture and it's those same photos that whether they're trolls or whether they're just people wanting to be offended on social media, mm -hmm. those types of things get targeted Absolutely. and people get mad at something that is so foreign to them. Right. How often do you encounter that? Uh, you know, I typically avoid the comments section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good thing to do because, uh, with my with my photos i and and like the people that i'm you know showing in my images like um i love the photo like i'm not going to post a photo that i don't love mm -hmm. you know or that i can back you know 
And so typically I'm just like, well, if you don't like it, you don't like it. And if you don't want to look at it, don't look at it. <laughs> and you know what I think is really important too with photos like that is um, the copy or, you know, the text at the bottom of it, right? Yeah. Like to put it in context. You have to have context. Exactly. Yeah, you have to have context. Um, it, it, it really frustrates me whenever I see images come from Alaska from somebody typically not from here. And it's like a photo with zero context. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, you're like perpetuating every stereotype you possibly could about Alaska and Alaskans. And it just drives me nuts. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw a social media post that you posted a while back, maybe maybe a few years back, yeah. where a a large publication, I won't say what it is, was looking for a photographer to shoot some stuff up north. Yeah, yeah. And instead of a, employing someone here, a right. local that knows the culture, knows, mm -hmm. you know, the atmosphere, they sent somebody from New York. Yeah. Yeah, that always drives me nuts. <laughs> it really does. Um, uh, yeah, I remember doing that post. I was pretty frustrated at that time. <laughs> I mean, I, I was frustrated after yeah. I read that. I, I mean, I was 100% on your side. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, it drives me nuts because it, you know, to just send somebody up from the lower 48 that don't knows nothing about a complex culture or state to expect them to understand it within three days because realistically that publication is probably only sending them for about three days. Mm -hmm. You know, I do enough um, field work to know like how long they're probably going to send them and to completely like grasp and document it correctly. Um, and respectfully. And respectfully. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think it could be, it's, it's just not done well. And then you see the story come out and you're just like, oh my God, like they miss this, they miss this, they miss this. And it's because they don't know what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it drives me nuts. I've even seen local publications. I was in college and, uh, you know, paying attention to what's happening locally, whether it's through social media or, you know, physically ever actually going to the website. And there was this story, this must have been 2000. I'm going to guess 2008, um, 9, or 10, something like that. But what it was is it was a story. I'm not exactly sure what the story was about, but the photos that they'd chosen to show from the villages, mm -hmm. one of them was front and center, and it was an empty bottle of R&R &R from the village. I'm like, yeah. that is, that's actually perpetuating right. a stereotype. Absolutely. And that was done locally yeah. by local journalists. Mm -hmm. So if... Local journalists have difficulty uh, respectfully telling the story, mm -hmm. then it would stand a reason that people from the lower 48 would have even more of a difficult time telling Absolutely. that same story. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I see th things like this all the time. I was just texting with some friends via Instagram, uh, like sending them photos from this uh, <laughs> from this New Yorker spread that they had. And this photographer went up to Utkiavik and, you know, spent some time there and took a bunch of photos at night. And, you know, they're pretty photos, but uh, it comes back to, like, context. Like, he had zero context that went with the images. Um, like, one of the images was of, like, uh, the inside of a truck and it was completely covered in snow. People are like, oh, man, that's crazy. That's nuts. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of abandoned vehicles up there because it's really hard to get rid of your vehicles up there and yeah that it's an abandoned vehicle and the there's just snow inside like that's what it is yeah. you know it's not like somebody left their door open at night and their car filled up with snow it's like give them some information with this photo like uh, you go there and you see like 20 cars on the side of this road, you know, it's like, come yeah. on, man. <laughs> you know, at that point, it comes down to what story are you trying to tell? Right. You know, are you trying to come up with or are you trying to convey like this fictional understanding mm -hmm. of this place or is it based in reality? Right. And like you said, this photo of this truck full of snow mm -hmm given with no context as somebody who has no frame of reference for something like that, 
they would think something like you just said, which is, oh, they accidentally left their, uh, they were negligent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they exactly. left their door open overnight and then it just dumped snow on the inside, right? Right. Which is, couldn't be farther from the truth, right? right? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there's more on that too. Because like there was one in one of the first posts that they had, it was like something about him not seeing anybody or finding anybody to talk to while he was there. And I was like, what? Like, you had a hard time meeting people at the store that everybody goes to in the day? Like, did you have a hard time, like, meeting somebody at the hotel you were in? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's just like trying to perpetuate these stereotypes of Alaska that just drives me nuts. Well, I think the reason that that story was probably told that way is it's easy for somebody who's never been here to grasp. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be afraid of the unknown, right? I mean, how long have humans been afraid of the unknown? I mean, it's forever, right? right, right. As, as long as humans have been humans. We've been scared mm -hmm. of things that we don't understand. And so to convey it in that way that Alaska is cold. Okay, mm -hmm. everyone gets that. Yeah. This place is isolated. These people are going to be, quote, different or weird, unquote. Yeah. So do you have a favorite place to visit? Uh, I love Northwestern Alaska. Like I love the region where my family's from. I love going to Kivalina, um, White Mountain, Point Hope, Utkiavik anytime. Like I always have a good time there. Uh, I love it up there. Kaktovik. Like those are some of my favorite places to go to. Anaktuvik Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a handful. <laughs> so what is... What's one of the first things you do once you get to one of those places? Oh, that's easy. First thing I do is as soon as I get off the plane, I go to wherever I'm staying, drop off my bags, rearrange my camera gear, and just walk around. Like, just take a nice long walk and like around the whole village as much as I can. With your camera gear? Yeah, always. Yeah. Um, I want to, like, I, I think it's, especially if it's like a place I've never been I want to like my goal is to always try and figure out like why they chose that place where they where they settled um, and just try and like figure out like the people's connection to that specific place of land. Yeah. And in trying to understand why they settled in that place is your understanding of that. I mean, mm -hmm. do you, are you going to museums? Are you talking to people or is it based on your general understanding of people generally look for rivers, right? Because yeah. rivers, you know, things like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, then once I figure out, like, so there's the river, maybe there'll be ice fishing later. There's the, like, you know, maybe they'll pull water from there later. Like, I can kind of look around and try and figure out a shot list in my head of what I want to try and show um, for that specific community. Have you ever been contracted uh, by, by somebody and they're like, okay, this is the story we want to tell. And you have some pushback and you're just like, that story either can't be told or a better way to tell that story is. Yeah. Um, not so much these days. I've been pretty good about, um, you know, if I feel like a client, doesn't really get it or the writer doesn't really get it or somebody doesn't get it. Like I just try and avoid it uh, and try and avoid that job. Just like I'm not available or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you come to me with like a good idea of like the story that you want to tell, um, I'll totally do my best to try and make it happen. Uh, but there's been jobs in the past when I was starting out where I'm just like, I would be photographing for him being like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't <laughs> believe I have to do this. This feels terrible. It's a bad feeling. And I've tried to make up for it over the years. Like, I'm like, all right, I did that job, which was terrible and told a story for somebody that I didn't want to tell a story for. And now I need to make up for it. <laughs> like, uh, you need to repent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I <clears throat> once did a job. I'm just going to name names now. Um, I can decide whether or not we want this later. But so I once did a job for Shell Oil in Utkavik. And they, like, it just felt completely 
terrible the whole time I was doing it because at the time, you know, they were they wanted to do exploration in the Arctic and they were working towards that, but so they wanted to win over the local natives. <laughs> and so like they put on this big um like barbecue for them and gave them like shell jackets and shell hats and everything. And I was just like, oh my God. I feel so used and I feel like so like all my people are being so used and yeah it was just a really bad feeling the whole time I was photographing it and so a couple years later I got contacted by Greenpeace <laughs> to to do some like investigative photography for them and uh I totally took that job I was like and it was to see what like Shell was up to <laughs> in the region <laughs> so it was like staking out in Utkavik for <laughs> Greenpeace so Greenpeace <laughs> wanted you to go and do some investigative photography uh on shell yeah okay so then that was like <laughs> how many how many years later was that it was probably only like three years later or something like that so it was still pretty fresh yeah yeah <laughs> but I was like staking out like with the long lens like watching what shipping containers were coming in on the barges looking at like what their staging ground there's no names on anything so kind of have to just figure out where they put stuff mm -hmm. and i just photograph the um the containers or like things that are covered up and you know i might not know what it is but like somebody from greenpeace might not know might know what it is so they just kind of wanted to see where they were at and have a idea of where they were at in their progress. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like once uh, on that same job, like I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing, and uh, uh, like so, like there was a staging ground next to like the football field. So I went and like made it look like I was taking photos of them practicing while like taking photos <laughs> of. <laughs> The, the staging ground for show. <laughs> That's awesome. So you were you were definitely undercover. Yeah, totally. And it felt good. It felt great. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you were completely <laughs> warranted in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, getting back to that first experience with Shell, did you feel like, I don't know, kind of like, uh, like a spy? Like you were, or maybe even like, a little bit of a traitor. I mean, because that's that. I mean, I'm not calling you no, that, totally. but it se but it seems like that's a little bit of what I'm hearing. Oh yeah, total spy, not a traitor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I felt more like a traitor to my culture when I was photographing for shell. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that's what I mean for shell. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, when you're young and you're starting out, you need money, you do it. Like you're just like, well, this is going to be a nice big check. So. And you know what I always think of is those jobs and those contracts and those experiences are so important because you can either decide there are people who continue to do that work. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, this is a paycheck. And then they have this like they're able to to divorce themselves from the work. Yeah. Right. Then there are people uh, and I'd like to. I hope I'm in that <laughs> the same kind of bracket as you where you're you see. Yeah kind of the error of our younger ways mm -hmm. and we use that to help kind of propel us into more positive and thoughtful things in the future right absolutely yeah looking back like i'm glad the only reason i'm glad i did it is just to have a clearer mind right now clear mindset of what i want to do and who i want to be now <laughs> and you feel like you're you're getting to that point where you are you're more comfortable yeah. With the things that absolutely. you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So how much of your identity do you feel like is intertwined with you as a photographer? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I grew up in Girdwood and I loved it. Like it was great, but I grew up very disconnected from like my own Inupiaq culture. Um, and so I feel like for the last 15 years, ever since I started photographing in the villages, um, it's just been me like um, learning about and reconnecting to my own culture. So it's all intertwined. How often do you come across another photographer's work <clears throat> that motivates you to go out and shoot? Uh, dude, I'm a huge 
like nerd when it comes to photo books and following photographers. Uh, there's so many people I love to follow and like watch their work grow and um, collect books and everything. Like I really love photo books. I'm a really big photo book nerd. <laughs> so if I were to go to your house, there's photo books everywhere. There's a selection of photo books. <laughs> I don't have like hundreds, but I have like a lot of really good photo books. <laughs> do you ever, maybe when you're kind of stuck in a rut, do you ever grab a specific one and you're like, all right, this is going to help? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be documentary or journalism photography. Um, one of my favorite photographers is uh, Sig Harvey. She's a amazing photographic artist and most of her work is all um self-portraits yeah so self, of her self portraits yeah, yeah yeah okay but uh the way she photographs them the way she takes the photos the way like the feeling that they convey and the feelings that i get from them it's just like it's completely inspiring and makes me want to get out and take pictures because you take a lot of portraits as well yes yeah it's my favorite you know, I would imagine there are so many different techniques of taking a picture of a person because with someone like me who is absolutely terrible, as you will see later at <laughs> taking photos, I just put it on auto. <laughs> yeah, totally. um, I'm sure you've learned kind of new techniques, whether it's like taking a photo inside, which is like phenomenally difficult mm -hmm. um, or taking a picture outside. Yeah. Um, when I'm outside, I typically like to always use natural light. I used to be really into lighting and I'd try and light everything. But over the years of just like my my system has grown a lot simpler. Um, I typically just photograph with a Hasselblad 503CW and a Mamiya 6. So it's like always square, the square format. And I usually just bring one flash now, like one little on-camera flash that I can just use to bounce off of the ceiling. Um, but so when I'm, when I first meet somebody or I'm working with a subject, the first thing I'm looking for is like the light source and like w everything is based around the light. And so it starts from there and I'll typically start off with, yeah, some natural light outdoor portraits and then we can move in. I love window light. I'm a big sucker for window light so <laughs> we can find a window to photograph next to because it's just so nice and subtle. Mm -hmm. But if I have no choice, I'll, uh throw a flash on top of my camera and bounce it off the ceiling. Never direct flash, but always like a bounce off the ceiling. So it just kind of makes all the light very even throughout the whole situation, the whole house. Um, when I first started, this is a funny story. When I first started uh, working on I Am Inuit, um, my goal for that whole project, I was like, I'm going to shoot it all film. I'm going to shoot it all six by six. Um, and I'm going to do it all natural light. <laughs> And when I got to Kaktovik, uh, I got there and I was like, oh shit, there's only 40 minutes of daylight. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't bring a flash. Because <laughs> oh, the whole plan was like, I'm going to stick to the all natural light. And uh, I got there, I was like, oh shit, this, is, this isn't this is going to work too well. Like I only have 40 minutes of daylight. So, every, so I do a lot of lining up of subjects and then like try and photograph them while there was some light okay and it worked out all right but like but the marie rexford photo i have like one of my most like well-known photos of marie with all the muck tuck around her when we took that it was like at the end of those 40 minutes and uh the only reason it really worked out well is because right behind me there was a little like led street lamp behind me and so when she was out there, like doing her thing, she's like separating all the muck tuck with the stick, so that way it doesn't congeal together when they store it, so it'll freeze, and then that way when it when it gets all put together, it doesn't congeal together. And um, so when she was doing it, you know, I, I asked her to stop where she was, and if I could take a portrait, and she's like, yeah, and I like metered for it with my little handheld light meter. And it was like, oh man, eighth of a second, like eighth of a second at two point eight, so it's like wide open on the aperture. And I was like, you got to hold really still. <laughs> I think it took like three frames of that. And uh, yeah, she did a really good job of holding really still. <laughs> and it came out. It came out super sharp. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I mean, that's 
that's really working with your environment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you had no flashes. You yeah. came in a little unprepared. Yeah. <laughs> but you made it work. Yeah. You know, in situations like that, so you said, I want to use all natural light, mm -hmm. right? Did you get there? And it kind of sounds like this where you have 40 minutes of light and you're like, oh, shit. Like, what <laughs> yeah. am I going to do? Were you hoping or were you wishing that you'd brought a light? Oh, yeah, totally. Because I'd always I've worked with like flashes in the past for years, you know, um, and you know, I was just like, oh, Brian, why? <laughs> why didn't you just bring that tiny little flash, dude? <laughs> and was it, that was a conscious effort to not bring it. Yeah, exactly. Like I made myself not bring it because I wanted to have a very consistent look throughout the whole body of work. And then it worked out like, um, you know, I started using it for, you know, different all. I started always packing it after that trip. And then it actually really worked out because then I started like putting on more rules for myself where like, okay, if I'm going to use this flash, it has to be a bounce inside or outside. So if I flash, use the flash on somebody outside, I still have to have something to bounce off of because I never want to do direct flash. And so that made it really fun and tricky because like I'd be like, hey, let's go outside. Um, it's dark, but I'm going to use this flash and I'd like find like a little awning like on a deck or something to bounce off of and luckily a lot of places are painted lighter colors up there so you know it was easy to find a place that was or or like a silver awning is always nice because you can pop the flash off of something silver and it looks extra cool so uh just always looking always looking up to see what what i got for a light source do you ever kind of draw from that experience and you're like i made it work then i can do this again always yeah um even like like a year ago, um, you know, all my career I've had digital cameras or some sort of digital Canon camera. And uh, like a year ago, I sold my last digital camera. I'm just 100% film now. Um, and yeah, it's just, it works for me. It's the way I like to work. So just stick them with it. So, I mean, you're making a conscious effort to stay away from digital for what reason? Ah. Uh I mean, I have no problem with digital. It's just uh, I don't work well with digital. Like I, this, that system just doesn't work well with me. Um, I really love square photographs. Like I really love my six by six. Like I, I it, it, in the end of my life, when I'm like on my deathbed and I'm able to like look back on the body of work I'm leaving behind, um, I made the decision years ago that I wanted it to be the, the six by six format. So I'm just gonna roll with that and um with like say like the canon system or an icon system like the 35 millimeter image i just don't work well with it like that long horizontal image i just i have a hard time working with it and i also have a hard time with like being able to look at it afterwards <laughs> and that's the nice part about shooting with film especially with your subjects is you take the photo and then you can't look at it like you can't they can't walk over and be like how does it look you mm -hmm. know it's like no we're gonna let's keep taking some more photos and make sure we got it <laughs> to somebody who is a non-photography kind of lingo or jargon person like myself what does it mean when you say you don't work well with that format um so when i pick up a canon or like a digital camera um I just have a hard time seeing with it. When I first picked up a Hasselblad or a medium format camera, I just felt like this is how I see and this is how I want to like how I want my images to be and how I want them to feel. Like I felt like when I first held a Hasselblad and looked through it, I was like, this is how I see things and this is what I want to work with. That's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what your first placement was? First placement? First, uh, like photography placement, like in a magazine mm, or... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So working with my brother on the Kaladi print ads, like we did a bunch of stuff for like uh, the press ads and stuff, which was so fun because we had to come up with a new ad every week. So every week we were trying to like make a new photo or make a new ad for the press. It was super fun. Um, that was where like my first photos that were like printed and published. I say I could, I think, um, my first magazine picture <laughs> was, uh, 
It was a little tiny ad in Alaska Airlines magazine for the Black Angus Hotel. No way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Black Angus Inn yeah. in Fairview. Yeah. So uh, there was this freelance graphic designer I knew, and he needed photos. He, like, he, <laughs> he needed photos of it because he was making an ad for him. And so I went and, like, photographed the room <laughs> and, like, the out. The like exteriors and stuff, and that was my first like photo in a magazine, <laughs> Alaska Airlines magazine. What was that Black experience? Angus. Yeah, Black <laughs> Angus. I can't even imagine them having an ad anymore. I know. Yeah, it feels like uh, shit goes down every single week there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it did back then too. Oh my god. What was that experience like? I mean, it was like. It was cool to see like a, a photo of mine in print and that's always a great feeling. Like seeing photos in print is always the best. Mm -hmm. Like seeing them online and like on websites is cool, but like being able to hold it and like look at it is so much better. It just feels more real. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, one day like dep like specific publications that I keep um I'm stoked for my kids to be able to look at them one day, you know, and when they're on the internet, it's just like, yeah, yeah, it was online. Yeah. I think that those, uh, those first experiences are super important because they kind of shape your understanding of how the media world works. Mm -hmm. uh, a good experience can motivate you to work harder and keep going while a bad experience can completely discourage you altogether. What's one of the worst experiences you've had on a project? Oh, man. The worst experience? Think about that one. Um, I don't know. I've been really good about, like, picking and choosing my work. <laughs> you know, um, I've been really good about, like, keeping everything cool during a photo shoot or an assignment. Um, I don't like... I don't like things to be stressful on while we're working because it's bad for me and it's bad for the subjects. Like if you have a stressed out subject and you're trying to make a portrait of them, um, you can see in the photo right away. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when people, when I first meet people for a portrait, like say I'm doing a bunch of headshots for some company um, and somebody tells me like, I really don't like having my picture taken, you know? And I'm like, well, you're like one of 20 people I have to photograph today. So I'm just like, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you don't like having your picture taken, but please stand right here on the mark. <laughs> um, but you can always tell in those photos. Like, it's what it's also like what your subject brings to the table. Like, if they come to you and they're like, I don't like having my picture taken, you're most likely going to see that in the photo. Mm -hmm. And then they're not going to like the photo. And then it's like, just come with a better attitude and we can make a good photo. Do you have any techniques to kind of make them relax? Not really. Um, whenever, I, like if I'm doing like headshots of people and stuff, um, it's kind of, you know, regimented. Like it's just stand here, face the light, you know, and stuff. Mostly like what I do with people though, is I just try and make them feel comfortable. Like I just talk to them, you know, just mm -hmm. like, you know, we're two people hanging out just need let's make a photo you know do you have maybe some go-to questions or you know ways that you can make people feel comfortable or is it just like whatever pops it's into your whatever mind? pops into my mind at yeah, the time. yeah yeah i have no no plan usually it's just <laughs> let's let's do this um i like to make jokes though when i'm working with people it's pretty fun <laughs> i like to joke about like you know, say we're like waiting in a room or anything. I'm like, man, why didn't they bring Coke for us? Like, you know, I'm just like <laughs> try and break the ice. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a green room. Where's the Coke? It's just totally fucking with people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant like Coca Cola. <laughs> no. I'm like, man, they don't party like they used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that makes you a little bit more personable, too. Yeah. Like, oh man, this guy can hang. <laughs> I had this one client, like, I've only used that joke a couple of times, but I had this one client, you know, about a month ago, and they had this. It was, we went to this museum and we, they had a green room set up for us for the artists to meet up in. And 
when we were leaving it with the, the one of the ladies that was like my main um, contacts there. It's like, yeah, the green room's cool, but man, where's the coke? And she was, <laughs> I was just like kind of like seeing how far I could push it with her, see what kind of like, you know, uh, humor she had. But did you have any <laughs> jokes before that, or you just went straight to the coke went joke? Straight for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what did she do to indicate that she was like? coke joke material <laughs> <laughs> nothing it was like it, i think it completely i think she tried to just believe that maybe i was talking about coca-cola <laughs> okay man just went straight for the hail mary right off the bat <laughs> that's like that's great Okay, so I don't do coke. I've never <laughs> done coke. <laughs> I just like to joke about it. <laughs> so I asked the crude Instagram followers what they would ask you, and I got a few good responses. Oh, cool. So Will Ingram said to ask you about the northern border TV days and how you transitioned into photography. Oh, shit. Cool. Thanks, Will. Oh, man. Northern border TV days. Oh, man, I completely forgot about those. Those were fun, though. Uh, Jay's show was, yeah, it was on, like, public access channel. I, I think so. Maybe yeah. let's start off by giving a quick uh, description of what Northern Border TV was. Okay. So, uh, growing up, I really liked Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, and Marty McFly skateboarded. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, like, so stoked on that. And it looked so fun and so cool. And, um, so like I made it very apparent to my parents that I really wanted a skateboard. And so when I was seven, my mom got me this, uh, Snoopy skateboard, like a flat skateboard. And, uh, that's like how it all kind of like started with skateboarding and just like every year I feel like after that I'd get a new skateboard, like, and eventually until I had like a real twin tip, like skateboard yeah. <laughs> with metal trucks. It was so awesome. But, uh. So I got my first skateboard when I was seven and, um, you know, growing up skateboarding, I got into filming with friends and I bought like, my first digital high eight or you know, digital eight video camera when I was like 14. And I like loved like making skate videos with my friends, like Ryan Walker, Eric Anderson, Will Ingram. Like we just film Sam Ingram too when he was really little and we'd film with that digital eight camera. And, uh, eventually like, you know, um, uh, like moved up and got like a GL one. That was the one I wanted. I had a Canon GL one with the death lens, which was awesome. By high school, I had that. But, uh, during high school, um, I was taking photo classes because they were the closest thing to video classes at the time. And, uh, I was reading this skate magazine. It was probably like a trans world or something. And... Uh, in the article, there was this one photographer talking to another photographer and that photographer was telling the other photographer that they needed to switch from 35 millimeter to medium format. And I was like, what's well, this medium format? It sounds really cool. And so I asked my photo teacher at the King Career Center, Dean Paulson, I was like, what's medium format? And he was like, oh, this is medium format. He's like, I have this medium format system here that you can borrow if you want. And it was like for the class. It was a Bronica ETRS. It was like body two lenses a couple backs but yeah i borrowed it and he let me like borrow it for like two years and like that's when i like really fell in love with photo mm -hmm. but yeah all from like all through high school and everything it was strictly like digital video that was my like real love like skateboarding and digital video <laughs> dude that's pretty gangster that he allowed you to borrow it for two I years know, <laughs> right? well i guess nobody else wanted to use it so he was just like yeah take it even after i graduated i still had it and i just returned it <laughs> and he wasn't like surprised you kept it for so long no, or he was totally fine with he it. was just stoked you were using yeah, it i was just stoked i was using it like that's great even after high school um I would go to his class after I graduated. I'd go like once a week and uh, use the darkroom, just hang out with students. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was great because I'd just like sneak into the school. <laughs> and like, hey, Dean. <laughs> hey, Mr. Paulson. Like, just go print print photos, bring my own paper and print photos. Yeah. But so, uh, and also at that time, so like kind of transitioning into photo and everything, um, in high school, I was working at Northern Border, 
And I was like, I think I was like 16, 17, 18, around there when I was working there. And Jay started his TV show. So we would film, you know, we were already, we were already filming always like skating and snowboarding and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was really easy just to like put edits together for his show and get him new stuff. <laughs> it was super fun though. Working in Northern was great. Like I loved it. It was like my, that's my, I think my, that was my only like real job i could say <laughs> it's a pretty good job <laughs> yeah it was great yeah and jay my my uncle yeah uh, jay lisko for <laughs> listeners uh i imagine was a pretty interesting fun boss oh my gosh he was the best like yeah we, we had a blast yeah he he was so cool and so super chill um even after i worked there we would still you know go skate or go snowboard yeah it's been a while since then but yeah he's always it's always lit. It's always ready to go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So do you have any, um, do you have any stories from those days? Maybe like, uh, in your mind, an iconic, like Jay story, an iconic Jay story. Oh man. He always just blew my mind that he like always blew my mind when he would be like snowboarding or skateboarding or anything. Like mm -hmm. he would always like pull out some crazy trick that like I would just be like, what the hell, Jay, man? That's amazing. Like <laughs> out of that's nowhere. How I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> yeah. And he always also had like his own like best stories, which were always great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> when you're hanging out at the shop during the day. <laughs> well, you know what was um what's always super fun for me whenever uh because we go up to his house every Christmas Eve uh -huh. and we do kind of like the Christmas thing cool. there. And uh, and then also, you know, I've had him on the podcast before mm -hmm. and I talk to him, I mean, somewhat often, but what's so fun is when you get him on a roll and he's talking about those old snowboard days <laughs> and yes. the characters in those stories are the people that we always looked up to. Absolutely. You know, yeah. like the heavy hitters of, mm -hmm. of the time, like you were hanging out with that person. What? That story involved that person, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's like these little slices of history. Yeah, absolutely. Super fun. Totally. Oh, I got more stories though. Um, yeah, quick one, uh, <laughs> the, uh, stories I think you might like that you, you don't, you didn't ever heard. Um, so when I was a kid, um, growing up in Girdwood, every Sunday we would drive into Anchorage for church. And we went to Anchorage uh, Christian Center. So it was like right behind uh, Borderline on Arctic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when I was like a little kid, like even before I had my first skateboard when I was seven, uh, the first time I ever skateboarded was in the one of the back rooms of the church. Uh, Borderline built a half pipe back there. And there was this half pipe in the back of our church. So when yeah. my kid, when I, my kids, when, um, uh, well, my parents would be like hanging out after church, mingling with people, talking to people like I'd go back to that back room and try and pump the half pipe <laughs> on some random skateboard because there would be like 10 skateboards just sitting there next to the half pipe. And yeah, we'd either play on it or like, yeah, that was like my first time rolling around on a skateboard. And also it was really funny because like uh, in the back alley behind Borderline, there was always they had like some ramp set up and stuff so people would skate in that back alley and when on a hot summer day like they'd open up the doors i'd be like sitting there in church just like looking out the door <laughs> watching people <laughs> skate <laughs> oh man that's great <laughs> it was awesome yeah then after church like i'd just go over to borderline and just like linger <laughs> that's great i bought my first real bear skate shoes there yeah yes excels <laughs> that's you know i um I'm I'm about three years younger than you, mm -hmm. and so I remember that shop. Mm -hmm. But I, for the life of me, I can't remember the skate park. Yeah. But I've heard so many stories of you know people sleeping under the ramps, mm -hmm. and I mean just just you know outrageous stories yeah. of uh, you know back in the day, just Wild West Anchorage, right. you know borderline <laughs> stories. Early '90s, especially too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, my um, my fondest memory, or one of my fondest memories, is actually of Jay. So Jay would be, so you walk into the shop and there's racks, and then to your left, that's where all the the snowboards were, and then the skate decks were a little bit further on. 
but there was like a little shop area where you know you could get your board waxed mm-hmm. and it had all like the hardware for skateboards and snowboards and all that and that's where jay would hang out mostly and he would have a big gulp full of <laughs> chew spit dude <laughs> Gross. <laughs> oh my god and, um, I, I missed s- that Jay I didn't get to meet that Jay yeah. <laughs> that was that was the OG snowboard Jay I mean that was Jay when he was younger than us now right. um, but I remember I'd have to spend so much time at that Arctic borderline that you know my dad and Jay my dad especially has always been of the mind like uh, you know uh, entertain yourself you know like I, I don't need to give you any money but on occasion him or jay would give me uh some money and i'd always get the same thing which was i'd go down to like the 7-eleven or that quickie mart that was yeah. right there yeah and i'd buy a tales from the crypt horror comic and uh a big red <laughs> uh soda nice. <laughs> and i'd just come back and i would just read yeah, it just read like these these crazy horror mm. comics and drink my soda, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember one time specifically. Uh, yeah, Jay was just like, "All right, Cody, here, like big old chew dip in, <laughs> and, you know, his, his his big gulp right there." And he gave me like, I I mean, I want to say like seven bucks, yeah, or something like that. And I oh, went and got my man. my goodies. Nice, <laughs> jeez, I remember the first time I met you. Really? Yeah. We were, David North and I, like, we would skate all the time together. Like, we lived right down the street from each other. In Girdwood? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, we'd always meet at the corner and head to the skate park. Yeah. And uh, the first time I remember meeting you was we went there, David and I went there, and you were there. It was just you. I don't think there was anybody else there. And Where was this? At the Girdwood Park. Oh, the skate park. It was just me hanging out. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And uh, you were... So we like met and then we were all like hitting the metal kicker. Like there was the the longer, like probably like nine foot long metal kicker had two sheets of road signs on it. And uh, that day we all were going off the side of it. (laughs) And I think by the end of the session or the day we were all going off the top of it <laughs> progression yeah <laughs> that's great so i remember this one time it it just hit me uh i was i don't think i was ever like good at skateboarding especially because i mean i'm i'm never gonna say i'm good at anything really <laughs> but i didn't have a very good handle on it like i did snowboarding and i remember that kicker that you're talking about dude mm-hmm. so sammy Sammy Lucky has always just been naturally gifted at skateboarding and snowboarding. Right. And so he was hitting that kicker and like just doing these, these odd like airs, right? Like Mm -hmm. indies and melons and things like that and just landing them. Right. And he was, he was like a year or two younger than me. And so I was like, oh, I need to try to do that. Yeah. And so I, I tried to do it. Right. But the board went completely vertical in the air i'm like right above it and it's between my legs right and it was i landed with it between my legs like pogo stick and and everybody on the sidelines like i mean in front of everybody right like one of the worst case scenarios as a kid right (laughs) he's trying to do something cool i mean skateboarding is cool right and i made it so uncool in that moment it hurts so bad that the pain is so vivid to me still. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So, Brandon Smith, back to these Instagram questions. Okay. <laughs> Brandon Smith asks, what's your favorite lens and what lens do you want to use more often? Oh, my favorite lens is definitely my Hasselblad 80 millimeter lens. Um for a Hasselblad, like medium format, that's equivalent to about like a 50 millimeter on a 35 millimeter camera. Um, but it's 2.8, super fast. Um, and it's just always like the perspective I always want. So, you know, it's not too wide and it's not too long. It's like just the right lens for me. And I have had that lens since 2006 and have been using it like almost every day since then. <laughs> it's my go-to lens. It's Zeiss glass, like... You can't, it can't beat it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Brewster asks, mm. do you generally ask people if you can take their picture or does it depend on the setting? Uh, I always ask. Um, all like, unless it's like a photo of somebody 
like a like a say it's like a landscapeish photo within a community and somebody's driving by on a four wheeler or something like that or walking through a frame. Um, I don't ask during then because I want it to be like a natural like sense of place image. But um, everything else, like I ask first and um, everybody's very aware of the camera because I, I just feel more comfortable doing that. Have you always been like that? Always. Yeah. You've always asked. Yeah. Always asked ever since I was a teenager. Like when I first was like starting out in photography, um, even before I worked for Clark, um, you know, I'd wander around with my friend downtown and take photos and, but would always ask to make portraits whenever I'd ask, uh, whenever I was going to try and make a portrait or like a, a photo of somebody I'd always ask first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever been told no? Uh, not as many times as I like expected. Like it's, uh, I I've been, told no maybe 20 times in my life which isn't bad for no, 15 that's, years. that's not bad at all dude <laughs> for 15 years of freelancing and doing like documentary work um I feel pretty good about those odds <laughs> you know it's one of those things where i'm sure before you started you know taking photos you probably had this thought in your mind that was like i'm going to be told no so often absolutely yeah totally um i mean one of my favorite photos that I've ever made um, was taken in uh, Quinnahawk uh, for it was my first trip for I am Inuit. And it's of these three guys that are naked in a steam house. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I walked by the scene and like saw them and like waved and said hi because they were just sitting sitting there mm -hmm. in the steam house. And I was like, Oh my God, that's a, like, that's a photo. And that's a photo I haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Like a contemporary image I haven't seen yet from Alaska. And so I walked by and I got, got like 20 feet away from where they were. And I was like, if I don't like stop, turn around and at least go ask, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. Even though I was sure it was going to be a no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, they're going to say no. Like it's three naked guys in a steam house. Like they're going to say no. <laughs> And yeah, I went and asked and like introduced myself, told them what I was up to, like what I was working on. And they're like, yeah, go ahead and take a photo. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Have man. you noticed, uh, or maybe you've always been like this, where you do pass a situation like that and you're like, I have to take that photo. I have to take that photo. And then maybe when you were younger, you get far enough away from it and you're like, I can just forget about it. And then you, your mind is always kind of going back to that. It always goes back. Yeah. Any photo I skipped or didn't take, it's like, it sits there in the back of my head, like that regretting, that regret, that feeling of regret. And that's why it's like always important to, to at least try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So Emily Mesner asks, what do you wish you knew earlier on in your career about the industry? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I wish that I knew it's always better to go in with a team and it's always better to work with people and not try and go at it alone. Um, for the last five or so years, I've really tried to make an effort of building more of a community around myself of other photographers and journalists and documentary people, um, just because it, it makes the work so much better. Um, when you have other people looking at your work and you have other people editing your work and just like having those opinions really help a lot. Um, I used to just try and do everything by myself where I just like send out my portfolio and just try and get jobs from photo editors. But then over the years, it's been like, okay, I should, you know, should try and go to this photo event or this gathering to meet people and also like just build like a, a more of a community and like a solid base. Um, cause yeah, I feel like whenever we try and go at it alone, it doesn't, it doesn't come out as good as it could. Do you think that that's something that you had to learn? Like if you kind of sci-fi scenario, if you were to be able to go back and tell your younger self this, do you think that that younger Brian would listen? Uh, I think so. Um, I think younger Brian would listen, <laughs> but, uh, it's something I definitely had to learn along the way because I didn't go to school. Like I didn't go to like photojournalism school or college mm -hmm. and um you know so i didn't have those early on critiques of or have like those other early on opinions of my work from other people and didn't build those relationships early on and uh i think it's something you just like as a freelancer that 
is going at it by themselves at first. It's something you have to learn because it's it's important to uh, have those opinions. So sorry. No, you're good. Ugh. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you know the reason I asked the question is because. I don't know if younger Cody would listen to future Cody. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I've always been uh, very stubborn. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is cool. Yeah. And I want to do it this way because mm -hmm. I firmly believe that, you know, something that I put lots of time and energy into, I believe that it is something that I'm going to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And so... I think it'd be very difficult to go back and tell myself like, hey, be nicer or, you know, like, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk to more people mm -hmm. and, you know, whatever. Right. Whatever advice my future self would want to give my younger self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure that I would listen. I, I understand that. Like, I, especially like when I think of younger Brian, like, um, Especially because, like, I am actually super introverted. <laughs> and that's why I actually really enjoy photography. It really makes me get out there and, like, meet people and be out there. Because um, it's really easy for me to just kind of, like, bring it all in and just yeah. be by myself <laughs> for a very long time. <laughs> you know something that I was thinking about? And, and we're nearing the end. I have one more question. But, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like we could probably talk all day. I know, right? I love it. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I was thinking about is... I was thinking about the podcast earlier today, kind of right before you showed up. And I love the entire process of it, right? Like, so I like this portion of it where mm -hmm. we're having a conversation, but equally, I love sitting down and editing it and yeah. getting it ready for kind of like mass consumption and having that like that solitary time where I'm sitting there in front of the work. And, you know, like I said, getting it ready for everybody else to see, because yeah. I'm excited about people hearing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder if it's the same with you. Uh, kind of. Um, I like getting it out there for sure. And I love making the photos. Like, mm -hmm. that's my favorite thing. Like, I love holding the camera, looking through it, seeing my subjects faces and making the photos. Um, I don't do very well um, sitting in front of a, in front of a computer screen. I have a hard time doing that because <laughs> mm -hmm. I always just want to kind of get it done as fast as possible, but getting better at it because like I'm getting more, I'm getting more and more picky about like how my photos are toned, how they're like color corrected and everything. So I'm getting better at like just doing that part of the job, but I, I do love my favorite part is making the images and like spending time with the, uh, my subjects and yeah, and then getting it out there and being like stoked on it you know like, yeah this is what we made together you know a a creative endeavor like like that or like podcasting i feel has two lives right like we have the life right now that mm -hmm. we're currently like the present that we're living right now creating this thing and then you have the life that exists once it's out there into the world right absolutely yeah and then it it keeps going like you know it's so fun to see see where it goes and what it influences, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe even three lives, right? you know, going out there and then seeing people's reaction to it and then how it influences other creatives. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Last question. Cause, uh, like I said, I think we could talk for a long time. <laughs> so when we were kids, we were into filming skateboarding and snowboarding because that's what we enjoyed doing. And that's what all of our friends were doing. So we documented it with hopes that it would be in one of the local snow and skate videos here in Alaska. Is it sometimes a little surreal thinking about where you are now and then remembering where you came from? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like where I came from and where I am now. Um, I mean, they're not too far off from each other. <laughs> I feel like I've been able to keep a, keep everything steady good head on my shoulders mm -hmm. um but it is really cool to see like uh where my friends are at where i'm at and where we came from you know um growing up as like a poor kid in girdwood skate rat you know yeah and, like getting into photography and doing pretty well at it like i think that's pretty cool pretty cool little story right there <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> you know um no it's always a trip and I'm always very thankful for 
where I'm at and hopefully where it's going. Yeah. You know, and I, I think as I was writing that question, what I was thinking about is that, say, that first ad you worked on for Black Angus for mm -hmm. Alaska Airlines magazine, right? And then now you have your photography in National Geographic and, you know, New York Times. I mean, these are these are like legacy publications. You know, these are I mean, they're heavy duty. Yeah. And so seeing where you were then and then seeing where you are now. Yeah, it's a trip. It's such a trip. Um, I feel like, though, I've always been pretty confident in my work. And I feel like I've been confident in like the stories that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that they need to get out there. And I believe that people need to see them or hear them. So I'm just happy all the stories are getting out there. And that's that's a good way to look at it, too, is, is you're a conduit for that story to be public. Right. That's the most important part to me is like who's in the photograph and, you know, what what we're trying to tell people um in the world about about ourselves or them that's great yeah well brian it has been awesome talking it's been to you man so fun thanks so much yeah absolutely <laughs> thanks for being on the show hell yeah thanks for more information about how you can support local grassroots journalism go to www.patreon.com slash crude magazine Crude Conversations is written, hosted, and produced by me, Cody Liska, for Crude Magazine. Music was produced by Alcoda Beats.